verses 17 through 22. If you don't have a Bible with you today, we have Black View Bibles in front of you. That's page 1006 in the Black View Bible. And he was setting out on his journey. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The children may leave for Sunday school. We continue this morning in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, for those visiting, we've been last few months now. We've been in the Book of Mark, expositorily going through verse by verse, which is truly the only way to really preach and to go through the Bible. So we never miss anything. We don't skip over anything, but we proclaim the truth of God's Word and what God's Word has to say to us. I'm so thankful, again, for this past uh, Thanksgiving service as we talk about the sheaves. Look at the, uh, the right window there with the sheaves representing all those who have been brought into God's kingdom. But there's still many more to be brought into the kingdom. As that song goes, bringing in the sheaves. For the church is to be faithful in proclaiming the good news of the gospel for all. The gospel goes out to all. The gospel call goes out to everyone. Everyone may hear it, but we just pray the Holy Spirit then takes that word and opens up the heart, opens up your hearts, and opens up your mind to His truth, that you hear His call. As it said in this last verse, when He comes, when He comes and He calls for me, that's why Jesus came down from heaven to call you, to call your name, for he knows you by name. He knows who you are. He knows every hair in your head. Like the rich young ruler today, he knew this man, and he knew his heart. He knew his condition of his heart. He knew why he was coming to him. Again, we're here in the region east of the Jordan River. Jesus has now left Capernaum, making his journey to Jerusalem, heading to the cross, knowing where he is going. And the scripture this morning tells us he was setting out on this journey after he had just been in a home for a few days where he discussed divorce, where the parents brought the children to him. Again, we are to be bringing people to Christ. And then those who come to Christ must come like a child of Christ, childlike dependency. That is how Jesus said we are to come to him, like a child. To be totally dependent upon him for everything. But we can bring nothing to him. Salvation is only from him, and we must trust in him. That is childlike faith. Trusting the one and trusting in his word. Again, this morning we read in our text about the rich young ruler. We know that this man is a man who had everything life has to offer. He was head at everything. The, the, each gospel account tells us just a little bit more about this man. We know he was rich. We know he was young. We know he was affluent. In good standing in his society. He had money, probably a lot of property and a good life. And we know by what he said that he was living a morally good life, according to his standard, what he thought 
was living a good life. Yet something is missing. Something is missing here, and Jesus is pointing it out to him. Something is missing. Is something missing in your life this morning? Do you have a void in your heart? You know that something is just not quite right. You're going through life, being a good person, doing what's right, doing everything the way that things seem to be, what we've been taught to do, but yet something's just not right. Something's missing. Do you feel like that this morning? Well, this, good, this young man, this rich young ruler, had that same feeling. This man who thought he had everything, he still had this one lingering question. This is a question that everyone must answer. It's the greatest question ever asked in all of human history. And there's only one right answer. And we can't afford to get it wrong, as I said last week. You must get this question right. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a question that's asked by many in Scripture. And Jesus here is pointing us to the way. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Scripture tells us he comes to Jesus. So he's coming to Jesus. He's coming to the right person. He's asking the right questions. He gets the right answer, but as we'll see, he gives the wrong response. This young man gives the wrong response. See, church, the narrow gate was wide open for this man. It's a narrow gate, but it was wide open. This man was stepping at the threshold of the narrow gate. He had his toes at the gate. All he had to do was entered by that narrow gate. And that narrow gate is the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't have one foot on one side of the narrow gate and one foot on the world. You must step in and enter in. Enter by the narrow gate. Do not go on the, to the broad gate. You know that the broad gate is wide and it leads to destruction. Again, this man had his toes on that threshold, the threshold of that gate. But he could not commit. He could not bend the knee. He could not bend the knee to Christ. He could not surrender his life to him. Call this being almost saved. Almost saved. How sad is that? How many people do we know that are almost saved? How many people go to church on Sunday morning, hear the gospel clearly, and then walk away? The Holy Spirit and Jesus right before them. They hear it. They know the answer. But they walk away. Walk away. He came in respect, this young man. He came in respect, but he left unwilling to admit his sin. He came unwilling to forsake everything and to leave the world behind for Christ. All this man really came to do this, this day and at this time was to add Jesus to his resume. He just thought he needed that one more thing. He needed Jesus. Jesus isn't something you just add on to your life. Jesus should be our life. He must be first in your life. He's not an add-on. He's not a supplement. He's not a fire insurance policy or get-out-of-jail-free card. He must be your life. But this rich young man came to Jesus just looking for that one thing that he thought he needed. He wanted to have eternal life. He wanted it. He wanted eternal life and to inherit it and God, but on his terms. He wanted all the benefits of salvation, but without the commitment. See, the cost was too high for this man. It was too high for him. And we know he walked away. For he was un 
for it because we learned he was unwilling to give up the world and his possessions for the riches of heaven. As Jesus told him, you could have the riches of heaven. I don't think he was listening. I don't think he was listening to that part, the riches of heaven. Nothing could be greater. We're only here on this earth a short time. We have eternal life in the riches of heaven. And I always like to think that those riches are Christ Jesus himself. The greatest gift ever given to mankind. We see Jesus here doesn't lower the standard. He doesn't stoop to this man's level, and he will never stoop to our level. For we cannot write the terms of eternal life. We cannot write our own standard for salvation, which many try to do. Many like to think that, oh, I'm a good person. I'm morally good. I obey things. I obey the laws. I obey commandments. I treat people well. That should be just good enough to get me into heaven. How many funeral services do we go to and hear that over and over again? They were a good person. Did they know Christ? And did Christ know them? That's the question. Do you know Christ? And does he know you? It breaks my heart to go to funerals and hear they were a good person. Rather, this person lived for Christ, and they knew Christ, and they died for Christ, and was willing to give up his life for Christ. Those are the funeral services that make me glad. For I know that they are then in the, in the throne room of heaven. Some services I just don't know, and I walk away with doubt. For I don't know if they knew Christ. They never talked about Christ. They never seemed to live for Christ. They went to church, and you wouldn't know it by how they lived their lives the rest of the week. We're going to be totally committed to Christ, and we're to live our lives for Christ so that people will know we walk with Christ. For we come to Christ by his terms, by the Father's terms and his way, for he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to him the Father, but through the Son. He is the only way. By confessing to God, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, I forsake this world and all it has to receive you as my Lord and Savior. To put you first in my life, that you have supremacy in my life. See, Christ must be first, and everything else must be secondary. when we do that, we get life and have it abundantly. And we have that joy. The joy that you, it's almost impossible to explain. But it's the joy of Christ and it's the joy of knowing that you are his child. So as we examine our text today, let's understand that Jesus is now leaving this house. Leaving this house and heading to Jerusalem. Again, this home where he spoke with the disciples on the matters of divorce, and where he discussed how one is to enter the kingdom of heaven, to enter it like a little child, coming to him by his terms. He's now continuing the journey to Jerusalem to the cross. So turn with me in text and give this amazing text in Mark 10. As we look at verse 17. Scripture says that he was setting out on his journey. And this man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus again. Jesus was obviously aware of what this man's heart was, what he was thinking. This man, Jesus now leaving the home, this man obviously took the chance. This was his chance. Jesus is on his way. I don't have another chance. I have to go to see this man. I have to see this great teacher. I have to ask him this question. This is the question I need to know. Do you want to know that question? The answer to it? Like this man, he ran up to Jesus. The text says he ran up to him and knelt before him. Obviously showing Jesus great respect. 
Again, this was a man of affluence, a man of influence and wealth, and he knelt before Jesus, showing respect. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And again, he came to Jesus, again, asking the right questions. He just doesn't get the answer in the way he expected it. There's nothing here to indicate here as well that, that he even believed that Jesus was the Messiah or the Lord. I don't know if he realized that who he was standing before was God incarnate. God in the flesh standing before him. He calls him good teacher as if just one of among many rabbis. You're a good teacher. There's other good teachers. You're a good teacher. Not, you're the only good teacher. He didn't say that. He said, you're the only good teacher. He said, you're a good teacher. Again, he had no idea who was standing in front of. He was certainly looking for an option of how he could gain eternal life. What's that thing that I can do or get? How can I do it? What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's how most of us think. What must I do? What must we do to inherit eternal life? The answer is nothing. There's nothing we can do to inherit eternal life. For it is a gift from God. And eternal life is a gift given by Christ. It is the Holy Spirit opening your heart allowing you to come to him, giving you faith to believe in him, to receive him, and then to follow him. He is the one who initiates it. It is all from Christ. It is all his gift. This is a question we as Christians are hoping that anyone would come to ask us. Don't you go through wondering, wishing that someone would come up to you, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to come to Jesus? What must I do? I certainly would. I, I, I pray for those days. I would pray, Lord, send someone to me. Bring somebody to me. Just ask me that question. This man just comes running to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus has this man before him. He could have told him, son, well, just say a prayer. Ask for forgiveness. Accept me in your heart. That's how we do it. That's how many churches do it today. Just say a simple prayer. You're forgiven of your sin. Jesus comes into your heart, and you're good. But Jesus doesn't do it that way. And I'm not sure that that's the correct way to evangelize and to bring people into Christ, bring people to Christ. We should be praying. We should be repenting and asking Jesus to be that our Lord and Savior. But Jesus didn't do that. He could, he could have, if that's the, the model for evangelism. Just pray a prayer, son. Invite me into your heart and you're, and you're good. Jesus, knowing that this man is not coming to him, though, to repent and to turn, he asks, this man wants a quick, easy answer. Jesus responds in verse 18, and he said to him, why do you call me good? It's interesting. Jesus goes off and asks this question, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Why did Jesus respond this way? Because this is what most people and what most men, men do. We don't really have a good biblical understanding of what goodness really is. And it shows by this man's question and what he called Jesus that he doesn't really have a good understanding of biblical goodness. Jesus is affirming and confirming what the standard of goodness is here, though. It's not found in ourselves. True goodness is not defined by us as human beings or by human standards. Goodness is defined by God himself, by his word and his law. The law defines what is good, and only God is good. That is true goodness. For we are not good. For we have all fallen. We have all sinned. 
God defines the standard and God defines the law. And so many people today judge themselves by others. They judge themselves by other people. Well, I'm not like that murderer. I'm not like that thief. I'm not like that alcoholic or drug, drug user or drug dealer. I live a good life. I'm a good person. And people like to be defined as good by what they do, and that's okay. But we do have some goodness in us in that respect. But true goodness is biblical goodness. And to understand salvation, we must understand that we are not good. No one is good, the Bible tells us. No one is righteous. No, not one. We have all turned our own way. Each are like sheep. And we wander away. And we all go our own way. Not seeking Christ and not seeking the ways of God. So by a biblical definition of goodness, we are not good. No one is righteous. People like to be defined by what they do. Going to church, being a good person, obeying the law, giving money to charity, working for the church and missions, ringing a bell outside a store, whatever it is that make people look good and make themselves feel better, to look good before others. That's not God's standard. Biblical goodness in Jesus here is defined it. He's defining the terms. He's defining the terms of this young man and he's defining it to us. Comparing ourselves to God, who is holy. Goodness is defined by God in his holy character. In his perfect law that reflects who he is. That church is how we need to judge ourselves and by that standard. And so when we do this, when you take God's law and you take who God is, holy, 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 who sits upon the throne in heaven, surrounded by the cherubim that no one can approach, that's the standard we need to judge ourselves by. We will discover we are not good. Now what Jesus said is true. No one is good but God. Paul writes that in Romans 3.10. He's quoting from here from Psalm 14.3. There is no one righteous, not even one. However, this young man, not knowing and understanding who he's standing in front of, he's standing in front of and calling Jesus a good teacher. He's getting it right. For Jesus is good. For he is God. He's God in the flesh. So whether he realized it or not, he was giving an accurate description of who Jesus is. Good teacher. The good teacher. The one true God. The second person of the Trinity. Jesus continues to present the law and the gospel to this man. But before giving the gospel, Jesus takes him straight to the law. That's what we need to do, church, when we evangelize. We need to take people straight to the law. For it is by the law we know that we can't keep it and we are not good. This is again something that doesn't happen today in modern evangelism. This is your best life now. Just be good. Live your life for goodness. Do what you can to do good. That is not going to get you to heaven. But that's what's being taught these days in many places. They're not being told about the law. But Jesus brings this man right to the law. People are told a weak, watered-down gospel that God loves them no matter what, accepts them for just the way they are. No. Jesus wants to change us. He wants to change us from the inside out. He wants to give us a new heart, a new nature, to be filled with him, to be changed, to turn from our old ways, and to live for him. That's what it means. Not living in the world in one foot in, in, in his kingdom. You can't do that. It's either all or nothing. Jesus doesn't back down. He doesn't water down the terms. There's no other way. You must come to him by his terms. Terms. Today in modern evangelism, there's hardly a call for turning away from sin or to repent. 
But they're told that they need Jesus. You need Jesus, pray a prayer, and that's it. And you're forgiven. You've got your fire insurance. And you can keep on living how you've lived and never change. Well, that is very wrong and very sad. Today, this text points out what true evangelism is, and what the true gospel is, the glorious gospel of Jesus. This text today is the perfect way to take someone to Christ. Again, first, by going to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, we don't realize, that are such a great evangelistic tool. And Jesus here used these as a tool for evangelism with this young man. We all need to understand the law. For it is God who gave it. For it is one sin, just one sin, that brought the whole world into darkness. That one sin, not many sins, but one sin. It's that one sin that we commit that separates us from God. It's not all the sins, it's just that one. It's all it takes. Adam committed the sin that plunged humanity into darkness and death of sin forever. But Christ had us on his heart. He had a plan to return. The hope, that hope of that candle that Christ came for us. The hope that Christ is coming again. Again, as you see, everyone's born with a sin nature. The psalmist tells us, in our wombs we were conceived in sin. We inherited our sin nature from Adam. There's no other way to get around it. There's no antidote for it except for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can cleanse us from that original sin to wipe away that stain, that blemish. For anyone to understand the good news of the gospel, you must fully understand the bad news. For it is the law. It is the law of the of the God of God that makes the good news of the gospel so glorious. It's the law that makes the good news of the gospel so glorious and Christ so glorious. Knowing that we've broken all the laws and we deserve nothing but God's wrath. Jesus tells this young man, he says in verse 19, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Notice here that Jesus didn't start with the first five commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Have no other gods before me. Make no idols. He didn't, do, he didn't go there. He went to the, the second five, six through ten. These human and relational commandments. The laws that define how we're to treat each other. That we're not to murder one another. We're not to steal from one another. We're not to lie to one another. We don't honor our parents. This is where Jesus started with this man again. These seemingly basic laws, the living and powerful, living and powerful laws, even unbelievers, people that don't go to church, somehow seem to live to some extent by these basic fundamental truths. Again, he doesn't mention the other commands that relate to God in our relation to him. The ones that only born again believers can truly keep and follow. At this point in the conversation, you can see the smile come across the face of this young man and whoop! The relief, whoop! Wow, that's it. Those commandments, I, I, I you can hear him saying, I knew it. I've been doing this all along since I was a little child. I've been, I've been obeying these commandments. I've done it. I've, Jesus has just gave me the best news I needed to hear. Because I'm, I'm, I'm better than most of my buddies. I'm better than the ones I hang out with. And where I've kept all these laws. Hmm. He says in verse 20, he said to Jesus, Teacher, I've kept all these things from my youth. Woo! You just see the smile on his face. I've kept the law. That must be my ticket into heaven. He's just waiting for Jesus to tell him, great job, son, keep on doing what you're doing. Obey the law, be a good person. But what did Jesus say? 
What Jesus did not say was, really? You have not broken one of these commands since your youth? You have lived a perfect life? Are you me? <laughs> you haven't sinned once, really? This young man was clearly not at the Sermon on the Mount. Where Jesus said, if you even look upon another person with lust, you've committed adultery. If you hate someone in your heart, you've committed murder, you're guilty of it. And if you've broken one law, you've broken all the laws. That's what Jesus is saying. But Jesus, again, Jesus revealed that the law is more, is more than simple outward obedience. This young man just didn't get it. Again, he just had a shallow view of God, a shallow view of what goodness and obedience to it really is. How do you view goodness? How do you view obedience? Do you have that deep understanding of goodness? Do you compare your goodness to holy God? That's where you need to go. That's where you get that true understanding of why you need a savior, and you need Jesus. Again, this young man didn't get it. He just had a surface level of reality of goodness and who God was and obedience. Instead of that deep down conviction in your heart that I want to serve the Lord with all my heart for all my life, because that leads to the Lord and forgiveness of sin. To make a claim to Jesus that he had been able to keep all these laws without breaking one. When viewed by the deeper meaning defined by Jesus here, the man basically was trying to earn his way to heaven. He was trying to earn it. The same way the majority of the world does today, through self-righteousness and self-work. Again, that shallow goodness. Comparing ourselves to the worst in society. Thinking that's what's going to get us to heaven. I was about the all dogs go to heaven mentality. If we stand here before God, if you were to stand before God today and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? Would you be able to answer it? Standing before God, why should I let you into my heaven? Yes, it is his heaven. It's not ours. We don't deserve it. It's not something we created. Why do we expect that we should just be able to walk right in? When we, done, when we spend so little time thinking about the Lord in our lives. It's not ours. Many today would reply, I've been good. I did this. I did that. I've never murdered anyone. I never stole or committed adultery. I went to church every Sunday. I gave him the offering plate. I was even a deacon. I was an elder. I was a board member. Church, all these are performance-based things. These are our works. We're to do good works. We're to be good works, but we're to do it out of love for our Savior. Putting him first. But there are some that think that's all I need to do. Just have my name and a membership role in a church, and I'm in. Some people think all I just need to do is die and get to heaven. Just live life and die, and I'm in heaven. Everyone goes to a better place. Those are the answers where Jesus would reply, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. For many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform any miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That's from Matthew 7, 21 through 23. That's Jesus speaking. The reason that many people think this way and do not understand the gospel is because the doctrine of justification by faith alone is no longer being taught in many churches. The gospel is seemingly in darkness these days. Justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, by the word of God alone, for the glory of God alone is not being taught. It seems to have fallen into darkness like it was before the Reformation over 500 years ago. With the false teaching of works, 
being a good person is enough to gain eternal life. So prevalent and so dominant in our society that we as the Church of Christ need to let the light shine forth again. That salvation is by faith alone. And it is by Christ alone. By his grace alone. Yeah, this is where Jesus shows his love and compassion upon this man. Scripture tells us he knows the heart of this man standing before him. Jesus here is not looking down on him for his misunderstanding of goodness and the law. This man was truly seeking an answer. He was truly seeking an answer, a legitimate answer for Christ. But the answer he got just wasn't what he wanted to hear. And that's what many today, they get the answer, but they just don't want to hear that. They want the cheap grace, the cheap gospel. I want to be able to come to church and then go party every day of the week and think that I'm going to heaven. Jesus knew that this man, despite his wealth and his status and society, was completely lost. But he had compassion on him, Scripture says. Again, he did for many others, even the lost. The scriptures tells us God is so good he makes it rain upon the just and the unjust. He gives good things to the just and the unjust, the saved and the lost. But a day is coming when his wrath will be poured out upon this world and that there will be a judgment day and everyone will be standing before the king. The response now from Jesus is that he will be asking this man to put his money where his mouth is. He's asking him, really, you've kept all these commandments? Well, let's see if you've kept all these commandments. Jesus is saying, essentially, okay, you've kept the relational laws. Demand now I want you to keep the laws that apply to me, the laws that apply to God. Let's put it into practice right now. If you've been so faithful to the law, you've told me you've done it since your youth, you've kept the laws, Let's see if you really mean it. Jesus says to him, Jesus says to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have to give to the poor, and you will treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Wow. He just laid it right out there. He didn't change his standards. He didn't lower the standards. He actually increased the standards for this man, renew his heart. Let's be very clear, Jesus isn't making a new rule here for being a believer. He's not saying that we saved, that we all must sell everything that we have, our homes, empty our bank accounts, live in poverty and sell them out. That's not what Jesus is saying. Because he was speaking to this man. But in a way, Jesus is also speaking to your hearts. What is it in your heart that is keeping you from Christ? But this man would have to be money. And Jesus knew that in his riches. But what is it that keeps you from following Christ? Because Jesus is asking that same thing to you. Give it up. Let it go. And come follow me. Jesus was going straight to the attitude and heart of this man. Who loved his money, his earthly possessions more than anything else. You have kept the law. Young man, but what about the first five? What about the first one? What about the first one? You shall know other gods before me, Exodus 23. Money and possessions took first place in the heart of this man. Again, what is it in your life that takes place? Takes a higher place than your relationship to God in this life. Is there anything in your life that takes higher precedence? Is there anything more important to you in your life than the relationship with God and to follow him? Is he above everything? Is Christ above your money? Is he above your family? Is he above your possessions or your hobbies? Jesus taught us earlier in Mark that it is not to our advantage and our gain to get rid of anything that would keep us from God. A hand, a foot, an eye. He's telling us to get rid of it. Basically, our spiritual priorities need to be set straight. This man was deaf, though, is what Jesus was telling him. He missed it completely. The treasure promised in heaven. 
Jesus told them right in the scripture, treasure in heaven. You think that would have piqued his interest a little bit, but it didn't. But he was more concerned about his treasures here on earth. More concerned about storing up treasure on earth than treasure in heaven. These treasures on earth that we can't take with us, that will fade and rust and rot. Rather than the eternal treasure that never goes away in heaven. Is Christ your treasure? Is he your treasure? When the man heard what Jesus said to him, we're told in verse 22, he was disheartened by the saying, and he went away sorrowful. He walked away, for he had great possessions. This verse is the word disheartened or sad, as the King James has it translated. In the Greek, it has even a more deeper meaning. Sad just doesn't even encompass the full description of how this man felt walking away. He was downcast. He was devastated. He was crushed. This man came running to Jesus, but he walked away. He ran to Jesus and then walked away. How many people do we know that run to Jesus, stand at the threshold of the narrow gate without wanting to step over, and they turn and walk away sad, devastated, because of the love of the world more than the love of Christ. All his possessions were of more value to him than the one he called good teacher and rabbi. He was measured against the full weight of the law and found wanting. For he knew that he had not fully kept the law, and he knew he was not perfect. But to him the world still meant more than turning to Jesus and to follow him. Is anything in this world worth more than Christ? Can you hear and then walk away? Many do. Many hear and walk away without a care. Many hear the greatest news ever. This is the greatest news ever. That Christ died for you. He died for your sins. And all you have to do is receive him and believe him and to follow him with your whole heart. Put him first. Greatest news ever. This man had Jesus standing before him for the forgiveness of sin. Many have stand and stood at the narrow gate, but they turn away, almost saved. How many people do we know that are almost saved? They almost get it, but they are forever lost without Christ. Scripture tells us that he was rich, but he was really truly bankrupt in God's eyes. This man was more bankrupt spiritually than well, everyone is really without Christ. We're all bankrupt without Christ. But with him we're rich. We're rich in Christ. I've said it a thousand times, the poorest person on the face of this earth with Christ is richer than the richest man on the face of this earth without Christ. The poorest of the poor has more in Christ than the richest man on the face of this earth. All of us men and women, we're born physical debtors to God without any hope of repaying the debt we owe for our sin. What is God's requirement? The requirement is to be holy, for he is holy. 1 Peter 1.16. Quoting from Leviticus 19.2, and then even Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4.7-8. We're going to live holy lives. The minute we sin, we're forever a debtor and in debt to the righteousness of God. And we keep sinning. We keep sinning and storing up God's wrath, as Paul tells us in Romans 2.5. But that wrath is satisfied when you come to Christ as your Savior. The wrath is satisfied. He covers you with his atoning sacrifice, his loving, precious blood. The answer to this young man's question was Jesus. To repent of sin, to receive forgiveness, to believe in Him. For we've all broken God's laws. And this man broke God's laws. By the law we fall short, but by Christ, who lived a perfect life, He became our sacrifice. That's why we celebrate the communion table this morning. By faith we receive Him. 
We receive what is needed to get into God's kingdom. We inherit eternal life through Christ. I love 1 Peter 3 through 4. It says, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Again, as we come before the Lord at his table this morning, is there anything in this world that is keeping you from Jesus? Anything that is keeping you from entering by the narrow gate? which is Christ. I plead with you today to confess and turn and repent and follow Christ. Make him first in your life. Answer that call, that simple call to come and follow me, he says. Let us prepare our hearts now for communion as we remember the sacrifice that was made by our Lord Jesus. That's the service to come forward.